Well, welcome back, everybody. My name is Robin Rungi. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and it's my privilege to be the chair of the American Bar Association's Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice for this bar year. And a part of that um, role, which is awesome, is that I get to host these chair chats with amazing people doing incredibly important work to make sure that we are providing inclusive, right, and diverse um, legal services throughout the country. And this is one of the themes of my year, right, is making sure that everything that we're doing is reaching everyone who needs services and that all lawyers, regardless of background and experiences, are able to meet their full potential and participate um, in the in the leadership of the Bar Association, but also in the legal community. And I am thrilled because today we have someone with us that I have learned a lot about. And this issue has been on my radar screen for a long time, but I have to say, I think it gained greater interest and understanding from members of the bar and from law schools during the pandemic, during the COVID pandemic and since, because we really, all of us, I think, in the U.S. and globally became more aware of and sensitive to the wide ranges of experiences that we have as individuals that impact how we interface with the world and that the people we're serving um, experience. So Bridget uh, has taught me a lot about this. Um, we have worked together for many years, and so it's just awesome to have her join us because she really is one of the nation's experts on trauma-informed lawyering and doing trauma-informed work. Um, I have referred her to my colleagues in Bangladesh <laughs> and all over the world. And in fact, last year, uh, about a year ago, almost exactly, I had the privilege of seeing Bridget speak on a panel at the ABA Labor and Employment Law Section's annual meeting here in Washington, D.C. about this very issue, about trauma-informed lawyering. And so we're thrilled to have her. So I'm going to share a little more um, about uh, Bridget's background, and then we'll get into what trauma-informed lawyering is, why it's important, and, and what we can all do. So Bridget is the executive director of the Network for Victim Recovery of DC, um, and that's a position she has held since co-founding the organization in 2012. She has over 15 years of experience advocating to ensure those impacted by crime are afforded meaningful rights and access to supportive services to mitigate the negative effects of trauma post victimization. Bridget led the launch of the organization's International Trauma Education Project and is the co-host of this awesome podcast called Traumatize, a podcast dissecting the structural and systemic knots that keep us from addressing trauma. And I just want to give a plug for the Network for Victim Recovery of DC. As a member of the community here in DC, I am so appreciative that we have your organization serving my community, providing wraparound services, legal services, counseling services, frankly, all of it uh, to victims of, of crime. Um, I wish every community in the world, right, had a wonderful organization like yours. And so I just want to lift uh, lift that up and, and thank you. Um, so please let me know uh, if if there's anything else that I left out, because I want to make sure I ask you a little bit more about the Network for Victim Recovery of DC and how you all got into right trauma education and trauma-informed uh, service delivery, in particular lawyering. Yeah, thanks so much. And thank you for having me, Robin. You've been such a champion, I think, of this issue and so many others. And I have to just give you thanks and kudos for helping to really be one of the folks that was a part of building and creating MVRDC in our community and the support that you offered. We've changed a lot since we opened our doors in 2012. As you know, we started with two and a half FTEs. Those in the nonprofit space know, know that that means uh, full-time employees um, and now have just under 50 and have really grown. And it's such a testament, I think, to how the community really needed and wanted these wraparound services for survivors of any type of violence. And we really try to create a no wrong door model that is guided by a principle of survivor defined justice. This is the re really the recognition that we need diverse options to meet the totality of needs that different survivors of crime have based on their identities, their lived experiences, and that the traditional response systems to harm are not adequate to meet these diverse needs. And that's really I will just say kind of the, the main principle of what guides our work. But trauma-informed lawyering really was a part of my passion before even walking into 
um, the opportunity I had to help found MVRDC. And it started for me when I was a baby lawyer and I was representing survivors, many who were survivors of gender-based violence, some surviving family members of homicide. I worked a lot, a lot with law enforcement. And this was in Maryland in our neighboring jurisdiction. And what I was finding is thematically, so many of my clients were telling me that the most um, harmful part of their experience was not always the actual victimization, but the way in which the system responded to them. And I got this idea that if, if law enforcement, if first responders, who were many of the folks my clients were connecting with in the acute moments following victimization, that if they had the tools and if they were equipped with the resources to be what I thought at the time was just more human centered. I learned later it was trauma responsive. If they had an understanding of the neurobiology, how trauma impacts our brain, our behavior, our memory recall, that maybe my clients' lives would be different. So I became a certified police instructor in Maryland back in 2009. I developed a curriculum that was really focused on trauma informed care for first responders. And it was very quickly that I realized this was a missing gap in the legal profession. And what I know is that trauma education has changed me not only as a lawyer, but as a leader. It's changed how I show up in my own organization. Um, the awareness I have about how we sustain passion in this work, how we can be ethical in our practice as lawyers. And I, I just am really excited to talk to you a little bit more about how do we bring this to everyone, regardless of the type of area of law that you practice. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Bridget, for sharing more of your background. I actually didn't know all of that. And uh, and that's just uh, tremendous. So I guess the first place to start really is um, this term of art, right? Like, let's break it down. When we say trauma-informed, uh, what do we mean? And, you know, we share some overlapping background, right? As you know, I also have worked with survivors of gender-based violence. And I think um, I wish it had come to myself and my peers when I was a baby lawyer uh, a lot sooner, right? Because I absolutely um, recognize that representing survivors. I now say in my 50s that I carry the lives and experiences of all these amazing people that I have served over the years. Like they never go away. Um, and and they hit me at different points in, in different ways. Um, but, and so I'm happy. And so in fact, I'm overjoyed um, that you're leading that work in that field. But I want to lift up that last thing you're saying, which is that now I'm realizing in no matter what area, <laughs> right, you're practicing, this is a really important set of tools and knowledge to have in your uh, tool chest um, to be a better lawyer, to provide, as you said, ethical representation. But I think it's another one of these terms, right, that we all walk around thinking we know what it means. And I know until I really listened to you um, that I did not have a comp comprehensive understanding. So start us off by understanding what is trauma-informed lawyering? Yeah, I always like to orient folks in this discussion. Um, we must understand what is trauma. And sometimes the most helpful way to do that is to actually talk about what it's not. Because the way we've been taught to think about it is really the opposite of how it shows up in reality. We were taught that trauma was kind of these capital T events. We often think about abuse, neglect, serious physical violence. And while certainly those events can make someone much more likely to be exposed to trauma, trauma is simply a set of factors, something that's threatening, dangerous, and out of my control. And when you look to research from folks like Dr. Sandra Bloom, it's when that threatening, dangerous, out of my control experience is too much stress, too fast all at once. Mm. And so when we think about experiences, when we think about um, even circumstances like living within systems of white supremacy and daily exposure to racism and other forms of oppression, anything that is threatening, dangerous, out of my control, based on my identity, my lived experience could be trauma exposure. Trauma is not defined by an event. It's actually defined by the person who experiences that event. Uh, I just want to stop and lift that up, Bridget, because you just said something really important. I think my whole life, I thought this was about, right, the event but it's the person experiencing it. It's that perspective. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just want to really emphasize It, it is this aha moment that I see in so many folks. And I think for lawyers in particular, there's kind of two pathways to think about this. Once we have a deeper understanding of what trauma is, we recognize that trauma is so common, yet so unique. And we've all developed this kind of baseline idea of what we think trauma is. And particularly if we're lawyers that do work like gender-based violence, we're exposed to it. We kind of might have even a higher baseline of what we think a trauma exposure is going to be, how it's going to show up. But keep in mind, 
that someone's lived experience and identity with trauma, knowing when we know how common adverse childhood experiences are, how common abuse, neglect, poverty, racism, all the ways that someone can experience something that's threatening, dangerous, out of our control, too much stress, too fast. Mm. The presentation you know, that kind of brings a client to us for legal services can be about trauma when you operate in the space I work. But think about when you're someone that maybe represents a big corporation, you're someone that represents um, folks who are accused of causing harm through violence. Maybe you're somebody who represents, um, you know, uh, any any sector you can imagine, whether it's folks that are experiencing discrimination. So there's just any reason that a client comes to us, we are not just responding to the need that's being requested, but it's all of what they've experienced in their continuum of life where they could have been a trauma survivor unrelated to the legal issue. And so the reason trauma-informed care matters, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like, is that if we want to be ethical in how we practice both in competency, but also in building trusted attorney-client relationships, the core, the really epicenter of how we do that is centered around making sure that person can show up fully, can be honest, that when they can't be present because of a past trauma exposure is sort of activating how they're able to engage and interact with us, that we have the shared language and the tools to get them back into the present conversation and do the best um, you know, representation possible based on our trauma-informed skills. And I think mm. so many lawyers, just like myself, we didn't get the opportunity to learn what that is, what that looks like. We're not taught that. And so we have mm -hmm. to sort of figure out how do we bring that education to lawyers, especially when they've never seen themselves in the way in the sector that they practice needing to understand what trauma informed care is. And I, I think about it in the context of client interviewing that we may have learned in school, right? Or client counseling, that this is like a critical part of that. And then the other piece that that really, Bridget, you've helped me understand is, again, we need to focus on the person or the entity we're representing. By the way, when you represent an entity, you're representing the person, yeah. representing the entity. Let's just like break it out, right? Like, yeah. And I always think about, you know, I did a lot of work with people who do estate planning, right? And they said to me, Robin, these aren't my issues. And I'm like, I cannot fathom now that I have been through this with my own family, losing my father, like one of the most stressful times in my life when I went to see, right? An estate planning lawyer, was around my losing my family member, right? And so like, again, just we can, in immigration issues as you, I mean, there's so many layers here, but then the other piece is us, mm -hmm. right? That we're also whole people. And so part of this trauma informed is being formed about not just how we're reacting, right? And how we're supporting that person, but our own experiences, right? How that might be impacting how we're seeing things or serving our clients, right? Yeah. Well, thank you for humanizing the conversation, you know, just thinking about um, the loss of your father. And I'm really sorry that on top of that, it was compounded by what I often call the business of trauma, which means life doesn't stop. Right. You had to go talk to a lawyer. And, and we know that that can be hard to engage in legal services when maybe the event itself is traumatic, but even sometimes when it's just extremely stressful. So trauma-informed skills help us as lawyers navigate people through the most difficult moments of their life, whether or not they are related to trauma exposure. So I sort of pitch this as like, it's a win-win. And when we look to SAMHSA, I don't know if folks are familiar, this is um, really the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is the organization that kind of created a template of what trauma-informed approaches look like in any sector. And we've applied this in the medical setting, we've applied this in our training for lawyers, but it's really grounded in six principles that every lawyer should know how to concretely implement into their legal service practice. The first is safety, and that's not just physical safety, it's psychological safety. How do I explain to a client what comes first, next, and last? Because imagine every time, Robin, you're going into something that's uncertain and how the second you have a roadmap, you can navigate that in a much more practicable, a pract practical and even almost like, um, kind of like expected way than when there's no guidepost of how you can expect that experience. If every lawyer just explained, here's what you can expect from me in our interactions. 
Of course, right. that goes hand in hand with trust and transparency, um, collaboration. So everyone in the legal practice having shared trauma-informed language, empowerment, voice, and choice, and really understanding the unique identities of one's culture mm -hmm. and how that's going to impact how they experience us based on our own identities. All of these factors are really critical if we want to create a trauma-informed approach in our legal service delivery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so helpful. And I love those six principles. And I know, um, you know, we'll make sure to share that uh, because I think that's a source, a resource that's available. Um, and that's so tangible. I just want to lift that up because sometimes I, you know, maybe people like, what's trauma-informed look like? Well, you've just given some really, right, concrete, tangible examples. Um, and so I think my, and really articulated to us why this is important for all lawyers, right? This needs to be in our tool chest at all times. So I now want to think more systemically, right? Like, so we've talked about this individually, but one of the wonderful things about the American Bar Association is that we take our role as leaders within the legal profession really seriously. And so what do you think are some ways that we can really um, increase access to the knowledge that you have and, and see it better integrated into the training and education um, and ongoing right training education that we experience as lawyers to make sure that we are truly meeting the needs of our clients and also meeting our own personal needs? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, um, it's it's really about how do we make this concept actionable? I think, you know, I think about it, the concept of trauma-informed lawyering being actionable when mm -hmm. we're aware of what it is, like truly understand it, and when we've accessed the information ourselves. So for me, that means... Uh, we create trauma-informed education, not just for law students, but for folks that have been in the field for years and years and have a lot of really good uh, suggestions and ideas to add to how we think about doing trauma-informed lawyering. I'll just flag that um, we have a really thoughtful partnership right now with the University of Maryland, where we are doing a formal evaluation of our trauma-informed lawyering training, because what we want to understand is when you go through a 90 minute awareness training, right? This is simply to give you more awareness about what it is. Does it actually shift your attitude, your behaviors, your practices and how you lawyer? And if we can get formal evaluation to suggest that this changes lawyers, it actually makes us better, right? It makes our jobs easier. It makes us sustain in the work because we better understand how it impacts us and how it impacts the way we show up. But then the access piece is really important. And I think we can have this awareness training available, but if it's not accessible to folks in all different spectrums of the legal you know, profession, it's not going to create actionable change systemically in the way we need it to in the legal profession. And so that means making it available not only for law students, but I would suggest that every law firm, you know, we have many law firm partners here in DC that put every um, summer associate, Hogan Lovells, I'll give them a shout out. Now for two years, their program for summer associates includes the trauma 101 training for lawyers going, budding into the profession. Um, I would say in addition, corporations, lots of lawyers practice in, in, practice in corporate areas. How do we make sure that they have this in the way that they have to show up as lawyers and represent the entity, you know, that they're and all the people that make up that entity, as you suggested, um, and really give everyone the tools and skills that they need wherever they've landed in their profession or wherever they're at in their educational journey? Yeah, that's huge. Well, thank you so much. Um, there's so many more questions that I have for you, Bridget, and I'm I'm excited about continuing this conversation um, and bringing your resources to more lawyers. As you said, you've already been doing this a lot of the firms uh, with offices in DC, but um, I just want to recognize and thank you again for your leadership in this um, and your expertise and um, being willing to give your time. Uh, today, Tess. So I want to just lift up again the Network for Victim Recovery of DC, this phenomenal organization serving our community. Um, you can find out information on their website, including about their trauma-formed education project and the podcast. They're in their second season. Um, I actually uh, teach law part-time and I assign their podcast, Trauma Education um, uh, Traumatize, <laughs> excuse me, Traumatize is the name of the podcast to my students. It's just another source of support and information and they love it. Um, so thank you. Um, and I hope uh, to see you again soon and uh, definitely integrating you into our educational opportunities here at the civil rights and social justice section. Thank well, you. thank you, Robin. And thanks for your leadership at the ABA and beyond in the legal field. Um, I'm really grateful for everything that you do. Thank you.